By the grace of Christ, my brethren, let us continue today from our lesson from the book of Jeremiah the prophet. And we shall read from chapter 51 and verse 59. Jeremiah 51 and verse 59, by the grace of our Lord. The word which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Shariah the son of Neriah the son of Mashiah when he went to Zedekiah the king of Judah to Babylon in the fourth year of, their, of his reign and Shariah was the quartermaster. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that would come upon Babylon all these words that are written against Babylon. <coughs> and Jeremiah said to Shariah when you arrive in Babylon and see it and read all these words then you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off, so that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. Now it shall be when you have finished reading this book, that you shall tie a stone to it and throw it out into the Euphrates. Then you shall say, Thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Zedekiah was twenty-one years old when he became king, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, till he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. <laughs> now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, on the, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. And they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. By the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled and went out of the city at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the, Chalde even though the Chaldeans were near the city all around, and they went by way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook Zedekiah and the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, and he pronounced judgment on him. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and he killed all the princes of Judah and Riblah. He also put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him in bronze fetters, took him to Babylon, and put him in prison till the day of his death. Now in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down all the walls of Jerusalem all around. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive some of the poor people, the rest of the people who remained in the city, the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon, and the rest of the craftsmen. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. The bronze pillars 
that were in the house of the Lord, and the carts and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all their bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the bowls, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered. The basins, the fire pans, the bowls, the pots, the lampstands, the spoons, and the cups, whatever was solid gold and whatever was solid silver, the captain of the guard took away. The two pillars, one sea, the twelve bronze bulls which were under it, and the carts which King Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these articles was beyond measure. Now concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits. A measuring line of 12 cubits could measure its circum circumference, and its thickness was four fingers. It was hollow. A capital of bronze was on it, and the height of one capital was five cubits, with a network and pomegranates all around the capital, all of bronze. The second pillar with pomegranates was the same. There were 96 pomegranates on the sides. All pomegranates all around on the network were 100. The captain of the guard took Sariah, the, king, the chief priest, Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city an officer, who had a eunuch, who had charge over the men of war, seven men of the king's close associates who were found in the city, the principal scribe of the army who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land who were found in the midst of the city. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. Then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. <laughs> these are the people who Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. In the seventh year, 3,023 Jews. In the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. And the twenty-third year of Nebuchadnezzar, Neb Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews 745 persons. All the persons were 4,600. Amen. Sarahiah is Barak's brother. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah, who reigned for 11 years before Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had made him king over Jerusalem, whom the word of God referred to as God's servant, Nebuchadnezzar that is, because he was going to execute the will of God, the plans and the counsels of God. And the four four years of his kingdom, of his reign, he was invited to the king, kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Zariah was with him. Zariah, as we said, Barak's brother, had the word of the Lord with him. It was given down to him from Jeremiah, who revealed to him that the end of Babylon would come, and it would be tremendous, tragic, and disastrous for them. And Zedekiah heard this. Zedekiah was a man who knew all the plan of God from the beginning. There was nothing that God hadn't bared witness to him. Zedekiah also was a man who really cared about the Word of God and about the will of God. But he had a very serious uh, downdraw. Down he didn't have boldness. He didn't have courage. He was afraid. But he didn't fear God more. He feared men more than God. And even though he was king, and he had authority that as king he could truly do at all times whatever he wanted, in reality, due to fear, he did whatever he wanted, but also whatever his rulers wanted, indeed, his counselors that were around him, his advisors. The Word of God assures us, and I want us to read this together, 
and the prophet Isaiah, chapter chapter 42, Isaiah 42 and verse 18. Listen to this. The Word of God says, Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but, by my, but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I sent? Who is blind as he who is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but you do not observe. Opening the ears, but he does not hear. This is a testimony that God shares, and it has to do with the servants of the Lord, and indeed the elect, and indeed the perfect ones, in whom he doesn't find a flaw or an error, but concerning whom he says, who is blind and who is deaf than these? Who is this except the one that I chose, made him my servant, and sent him? And what is the characteristic that defines the perfect man, the chosen vessel of the Lord, the servant of the Lord, that makes him deaf, blind, and useless? It's what we find in the same page later on. But you must not fear my servant, he says. For the problem that man has and makes him useless is fear. And fear, my beloved brethren, has nothing to do with faith. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Many strange things will happen in your life. You will have to pass through the waters. But do not be afraid, for I will be with you. They will not overflow you. You will have to walk through rivers. You will not drown, though. You will still have to go through fire. But do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You will not be burned. And even to Jeremiah, when he was called as a young child, and he told him, I called you. From your mother's womb, I foreknew you, so I can make you a prophet over the nations. And when... God laid His words in the mouth of Jeremiah. He told them one thing, Be careful. Do not be dismayed by their faces. They will be hard-faced. They will have a hard forehead. They will be wild and angry toward you. But do not fear them at all. I will not let you find yourself in an embarrassment. I will be with you to deliver you. And furthermore, I have made you like a fortified city, like a pillar of iron and bronze walls. Everyone will be against you, but no one will be able to prevail over you. And let me repeat this. When I was asking from God to explain to me how a perfect man is made useless, God brought me to the point when I was a young man and being trained as a petty officer we had a, a captain who was a very good captain. He was very educated in the methods of war. He had completed and fulfilled many military uh, schools in Greece and out overseas. He was a very well-trained man, and he was a great hope, let's say, for a great career in uh, the officers of the Greek army. At some point, there was a great fire in Pilio. We were in uh, Lamia then. And they sent us to go and put out the fire, him, me, and some other soldiers. It was a tremendous fire. We couldn't do anything. We were far away and we were just looking at, at it. Behind us then, the fire started. So we were between two fronts. In front of us and behind us, there was fire. And there I saw that captain in panic. He became useless. He could do nothing. He was completely useless. So fear is what makes a man weak, even to the point of making him useless. So Zedekiah had this characteristic. He was afraid. Even though he did care about the Word of God, he knew the Word of God. 
So, uh, in the four years when you went to Nebuchadnezzar, new conditions were created. Egypt rose up against Nebuchadnezzar. And all other nations rose up against them too. And it appeared that there was a great confrontation that was going to take part with many armies under the, the leadership of Egypt. And so Zedekiah's advisors suggested that he align himself with Egypt and the Pharaoh. So Zedekiah went with them. No, so Zedekiah went to Jeremiah and he, because he cared about the word of God. And he asked for Jeremiah to give him a prophetic word. And Jeremiah told him, you must align yourself with Nebuchadnezzar, not with Pharaoh. And Zedekiah said, I'm afraid of my generals. I'm afraid of my rulers. I'm afraid. I tremble. I can't do whatever I want. And here, my dear brethren, we have to say something that is very serious here. The Bible says, Whomever the Son sets free, He is free indeed. Which means, that we all, every one of us separately, have authority of liberty from God, to do whatever he wants. The only man who can do in his life always whatever he wants is the one that Christ has set free. There's no other man who can do this. <laughs> he delivered us from the desires of our flesh. He delivered us from the desires of our eyes, of our soul, of our heart. He delivered us from our thoughts. And from the weaknesses of our mind, He gave us the ability in our weakness to be able to approach Him. And again, the power of God comes upon us as it is written, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So whenever you kneel and are, get filled in the Holy Spirit, the power of God comes upon you. But He also gave us and our weakness, even due to lack of faith, because lack of faith brings weakness and fear, but also fear leads to lack of faith. So when we come to this point of weakness, that neither with the power of the Holy Spirit can we do anything, or with the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God that saves those who believe, and we're not able to stand, He tells us, give me your petitions, Take your petitions, go into your secret place of prayer, give them to God with thanksgiving, with supplications and prayer. And God, the God of peace, will preserve your heart from your fears. He will keep your heart from fears through Jesus Christ, and He will set you free. The only one who can truly be free even if he loses his liberty out of fear or weakness, he, is, he finds it easily again in this humanity, in this sea of humanity, is the Christian, the only one who can restore his, his hope. A Christian has nothing to do with the world though, a true Christian. A Christian who loves Christ and proves it by executing and fulfilling the word of God. A Christian who asks first for the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that is, he cares about the unshakable things and not the things that are shaken. The heavenly things and not the earthly things. For the eternal things and not the temporary things. For the Christian who walks circumspectly in the will of God and the footsteps of Christ, not as a fool but as a wise man redeeming the time because he knows that the days and seasons and times are wicked and evil. But Zedekiah did not have these things and God excuses him because he's in the Old Testament even though he's inexcusable because he knew the Word of God. So he remained, he became an ally with the Pharaoh. After the nine years of his reign, after Pharaoh was destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar 
rose up and came and besieged Jerusalem. Again, Jeremiah goes to, Zedekiah goes to Jeremiah. And he tells him, what does God say about me now? And, Zedek, and Jeremiah tells him, give yourself up. Give yourself up to Nebuchadnezzar. You will be saved. Your house will be saved if you do the will of God. <coughs> All the people of Israel will be saved. Jerusalem will not be destroyed, and the temple will not be destroyed. And what does Zedekiah answer again? If I give myself up, I'll have to go to Babylon. And I'm afraid that there, the ones that Nebuchadnezzar, first of all, took him, uh, the, uh, Nebuchadnezzar already took him there, they will reproach me. And Jeremiah tells him, do not be afraid, they will not mock you. Give yourself up and you'll be saved. And he, out of fear, refused to do it. It is terrible. This fear, external fear, is terrible for a Christian. I'm afraid to do the will of God. I'm afraid to speak the will of God. I'm afraid to walk in the will of God. I'm afraid of the world. I'm afraid of my relatives. I'm afraid of my friends. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid of my boss. I'm afraid of my colleagues. I'm afraid what they might say, what they might do to me. And what does the Lord say? Fear not, believe only. <clears throat> and how will I find this boldness to drive away fear? Perfect love drives away fear. And perfect love is only in God's hand. Only God is love. Only if God comes and dwells in you, <clears throat> will then the perfect love enter your life. And I want us to see this, my beloved brethren. Let us read from the epistle of John, the first one. First epistle, chapter 4. And verse 18. John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him, God, because he first loved us. And if we read a bit earlier than this, a bit above, verse 14 that is, we will see again the Word of God saying, John says, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. <clears throat> Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us, God is love, and he who abides in love, abides in God, and God in him. The only hope for salvation for man, for a man who is out of, uh, from his nature, weak, his only hope for him to have boldness, courage, and strength in the word of, work of God, is for God to dwell in him. And God dwells in us, first of all, when we confess to the name of Jesus Christ. When we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, then we have boldness. When we bear witness that Christ has saved us, when we confess that Christ has regenerated us, blessed us, and we walk according to His will, when we admit that we belong to the Lord, then the light that is lit, that is bright within us, God puts it on the lampstand. And there the devil can do nothing to it. But there is also something else that we have to see. For God to dwell in us, who is love, God who is love, and the perfect love to drive out fear, we need this. If we love our brethren, then God dwells in us and we dwell in Him. If we love our brethren. In other words, my dear brethren, 
if we want to have boldness, if we want to have strength and courage and not be afraid, first of all, we will have to love all our brothers and sisters without an exception. Without any exception. We shouldn't leave uh, even the slightest root of bitterness in our heart for one or two or three. And this will lead us, if we permit this, this will lead us to carnal walk and to the fear of us not being able to stand on our feet in Christ Jesus. But there's also a third thing. Whoever keeps the commandments of God... God abides in him, it says in verse 24, and he abides in God. There are three things that we bear witness to the name of Christ, that men know what we are all about. Secondly, that we make sure that we love all people with the love that Christ has loved us. And thirdly, that we make sure that we execute the commandments of God. And God's commandments are specific. I'm reading from 1 John 3rd chapter, verse 23. And this is His commandment, that we should believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, that we trust in the name of Jesus Christ, as it is written, in your name. We cast out demons, we performed many miracles, in your name. We heard your word, we preached your word, and we prophesied. Our trust can be nowhere else. Our hope can not be and mustn't be anywhere else except in the name of Jesus Christ. This is God's commandment which is accompanied by a second that is similar to it, and that we love one another as Jesus Christ gave us a commandment. So there are three things, my dear brethren, that we have to have them deep in our heart with acknowledgement and with, uh, 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 with fighting. We ought to fulfill these things. Absolute trust that we will be given only by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. We have to trust in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember how David was triumphant over Goliath. He said, you come against me with swords, with, uh, with armor, with shields, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And today, the Lord for us is Jesus Christ, to whom was given the name above all names, Lord and before which every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will testify that He is Lord. Secondly, that we love our brethren. And the way that Christ loved me, all of them, without an exception. And here you need to strive, you need to fight, because definitely some brother will, will bother you. Something will happen in your day. Something won't go well. But our fight is for us to love all our brethren without any exception. And thirdly, that we may confess that we belong to the Lord, that we bear witness to the name of Jesus Christ, that we testify that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and not to hide and be afraid of revealing that we are saved, our salvation. These three things will appoint us through the presence of God the, God the Father who will exist in our personal life. They will render us fearless. And at the same time, these three, three things prove our obedience, our de dedication, and our devotion to the Word of God. Zedekah, so even though he had all, everything else, he didn't have these things. He was afraid. And his life, the Bible says, was in evil deeds. And he did what was wicked before the Lord in the same way that what Jehoiakim did. 
He provoked the anger and the wrath of the Lord in his life. <clears throat> so that the Lord rejected him from before his face with a result of this being that Zedekiah made a wrong, disastrous decision and he backslid. He, he rebelled against the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and attached himself to the Pharaoh. And here, let's pay attention to something that the Word of God reveals to us. So that we may make correct, wise, and blessed and fruitful decisions, this isn't a result of wisdom in our understanding. Neither of our discernment, neither of our cleverness, nor of any other human ability that we may possess. The wise and fruitful and blessed decision that we will make is given to us by God alone. The Bible is absolute concerning this and, and clear. There is a spirit in every man, but the inspiration is given by the Almighty. And the Word of God explains this to us. Beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. If there is no fear of God in our heart, then there is no chance that there will be wisdom in our life. Let me repeat this. If God does not discern holy fear in our heart, the fear of God, which fear of God is respect, faith, and the face of the Lord, and the will of God, as it is revealed through the, the divinely inspired Word of God that is without lie. So if we do not have the fear of God, then the decision that we will make will, be, will never be correct and fruitful. They will always do harm to the point of being destructive. For that reason, people say, that poor man is unlucky. Other people can convict him and say, oh, he's a fool for doing that. But foolishness, forgive me for this expression, unwisdom, lack of wisdom and understanding is a result of the lack of fear of God. No wisdom can begin in the life of man if there is no fear of God. A disastrous decision of Zedekiah because he was afraid of men more than he was of God, because he lacked the fear of God, because perfect love never dwelt within him, because he never walked in the will of God. First of all, because he did not trust. Why did he not walk in the will of God? First of all, because he did not trust in the name of the Lord of hosts as David did. Secondly, because he did not confess before everyone that God is telling me to go and, and uh, align myself with Nebuchadnezzar. But when he asked for help and advice from Jeremiah, he told them afterwards, the things you told me, tell no one else. Only you and I will know about this. For that reason, the word of God did not benefit him at all. Because the word of God wasn't open in his life. And thirdly, because he did not love his neighbor as himself, and especially Jeremiah, whom he permitted to his rulers, even though he had authority to stop them, he permitted them to torture him and to send him into the most filthy and wretched prisons with the purpose of him to die. And if there was, wasn't a eunuch there who intervened on behalf of Jeremiah, Jeremiah would have been dead in the prison where the rulers of Zedekiah had thrown him. So he made wrong decisions. And my dear brethren, may the message, this message be for us today, because it is. 
I do not want to go into detail, we don't have time for this, but it is the message. In my life, I was always afraid of wrong decisions. And I always prayed and said, Lord, let me not make a wrong decision. I do not want to make wrong decisions. And I had, uh, I had um, combined this with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I had uh, said that the voice of God is necessary, the word of God is necessary, good, good. But then the Lord came today, and He led me to this, and He showed me that correct decisions depend on the Word of God, on the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and what not. But the main thing that leads them, the main thing, is your sanctification, your obedience, and your faith and devotion to the will of God. If you do what is evil, if you do not have the fear of God, so that you do things that are not of the, of the ones that I advise you to do, in a way that I advise you to do, even if you believe that you have guidance of the Holy Spirit, and you do have it, and you did when you had fear of God, that is, and if you still believe that God had spoken you, and God had spoken to you when you had the fear of God in your heart, now that the fear of God has become smaller in your heart, now that you are lukewarm, well, from now on, your decisions will be wrong. Not once, but twice, and three, and fourth time, and the fifth time, even to the point of him being disastrous. So I was terrified when I heard this, when I understood this. For that reason, I believe that God brought His Word in such a way today that fear may enter the heart of all of us, fear of God. Because everything depends on our, in our life on the choice of our decisions. If I ought to do this or the other. My brother, the more you remain steadfast and immovable in the Word of God, in the will of God, the more the fear of God reigns in your life, as He said, and as God said to Ab concerning Abraham, I know that God fears, that Abraham fears God, because whatever I tell him, he will command his household, and they will do it. All his household will do the word that I command him. And truly, he commanded that all the household have, has circumcision, and everyone got a circumcision. And for that reason, God says, I confirm that all the promises that I have given him, but also all the plans that I have in my mind, and the counsels that I have made for blessing for Abraham, will be fulfilled in his life. So everything in our life, my dear brethren, depends on our good decisions, and our good decisions depend on the fear of the Lord. Now, when man loses the fear of God, he doesn't fear God when his heart is filled with bitterness. When his heart desires other things. And he understands this, he realizes it. When his spirit becomes proud and arrogant. When the desires of the fle flesh grow, and I don't say that they become gigantic here. And when this happens, he doesn't run to God with fear in his heart. In the name of Jesus Christ. So that the blood of Jesus Christ may clean him from every sin. When he doesn't examine himself according to the Word of God. Examine yourselves. Let everyone examine himself and then partake in the communion of the body and blood of Christ. This is a very essential decision for me to partake in the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Very essential for the life of man. For that reason, the Apostle Paul doesn't hesitate to say, that is why many people are sick among you and many sleep. 
The fear of God is that which leads man to making correct decisions, to making blessed decisions, and to making fruitful decisions. The Bible says that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon because God rejected him. God never stopped loving Zedekiah. Why? Because throughout his whole life he cared a bit about the word of God. And that's why God gave grace to Zedekiah while he was alive. And he prophesied and said, You will be taken exile to Babylon. You will repent there. And there I will save you. So before the eyes of Zedekiah the king, Nebuchadnezzar killed all his children, all his princes, all his uh, priests, all the ones that he feared. He took him, he tied him and took him to, to Babylon. He did not kill him. Nebuchadnezzar made the right decision. And this decision was from the Lord. But, due to the fear of Zedekiah, disaster came to Jerusalem. And here I repeat this. Because of the fear of Zedekiah, perfect destruction came to his family, to his, to his environment, to Jerusalem, and to the temple of Solomon. So how serious are the consequences that one decision of yours may have, not only for yourself, but also for your family, and for your children, and for your job, and for your relatives. And depending on where God uses you for the church and for your brethren. So, the Word of God assures us of this. Where a lot of things given to you, a lot will be demanded for you. Did God trust you with a lot of things? Many things will be demanded from you. So very carefully, my dear brethren. Because we have knowledge, and indeed understanding by grace, we are taught by our teacher, Jesus Christ, taught by the Holy Spirit. It is not for us to examine our decisions, whether they are right or wrong. If we walk in the fear of the Lord, they will be right. But if in our heart, so we can understand this more correctly, so in the way that God gave me understanding, but if we have greed in our heart, love for money, Love for ourselves, which is the work of the flesh. I'm not talking about great sins here. God does not like it when you want to be attractive to other people. Neither as a, man, as a human being, neither as a young man, nor as a young woman. God is pleased when you want to please God, when you want to when you want God to like you. I want to be pleasant to God, pleasing to God. The Apostle Paul says, do we want to be, do we want to please men? If we wanted to please men, we wouldn't please God. And when I see people spending so much time and dealing so much on their appearance, I'm not saying that we must be ugly and unattended to, but we mustn't be lovers of ourselves, of our appearance. I'm not saying that we shouldn't dress nicely, but not provocative and, and uh, trying to be different than others because of our nice hair or the muscles. Let them have muscles and it's good for us to train and be strong, all of us, but not to show off. And the new thing now, the skirt is getting higher and higher lately. To show what? That we have long legs, legs and nice legs? We have nice legs. My legs are very nice. No, okay. What, what should we show? What are we trying to show? What are we trying to show? That we have nice legs? That we have a nice uh, chest? 
There we have a nice ear and we'll pierce it as well. Does God find pleasure in this? Does He like it? My dear brethren, may God give us this wisdom that is found in the fear of God. Why? Because if the wisdom of the fear of God is corroded by the diminishing of the fear of God that is in us, then this wisdom that we have is not from above. But it is a wisdom that is animalistic, that is earthly and demonic. And now you understand if a Christian who has lost his spirituality, his spiritual hypostasis, who has lost his sanctification, who has lost his devotion and his dedication, you know how you will end up? Like Samson that, w that lost his hair to Delilah. And though he was a mighty man of valor, full of the Holy Spirit and strength and power, not because of his muscles, but because of the Spirit of God. When Delilah managed to cut his hair, then he was like one of the other men. May God keep us. lest we become like one of the men of the world. May God keep us. And this is not only it, but she also blinded him. The devil and his children, the Philistines, blinded him. You know what he blinded him means? And we come to this point so we can see what we were talking about. Who is blind except my servant? Who is deaf? Besides the messenger that I sent, who is blind but the perfect one? And why was he made blind? Because he lost the fear of God. Because his, lo his love to Delilah was greater than his love toward God. Because he gave himself up into the hands of Delilah. He lost the fear of God. He lost the power of the Holy Spirit. He lost we'd say now, his Christian hypostasis. And he became like one of the rest, a man who is easy in the hands of the devil and his children, an easy victim like Zedekiah. But God gave grace to Samson. And again, his hair grew back. He, his dedication, his holiness and sanctification were in prison though, in bondage, in blindness. And he gave him the chance to say once again, let my, die, my soul die with the infidels. And concluding here, my dear brethren, from the message that with fear I'm sharing with you, I must say that God is good. And God's goodness teaches us to walk in the way that He wants in power and glory and the power and the glory of the Holy Spirit and in the grace of Christ. And if we do not obey, He tells us, in your prison I will wait for you to return so that I may save you. But to tell you the truth, I do not want to go to prison. I want to be in the absolute liberty of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this applies to all of us, amen? All of us. For that reason, my dear brethren, let us, let us nurture, let us seek, let us strive to fight the good fight so that the fear of God not only may exist in us, but that it may grow and grow and grow by the grace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.